I'm, I'm Shirley Pierce, and I'm the Chair of Council here at LSE. And it is my very, very great pleasure to welcome you all to this very special event. Um, to welcome all of you that are here in person at LSE and all of you who are joining us online. Tonight's a, a really special opportunity. Firstly, it's an opportunity to publicly welcome Dame Minouche Shafiq to her role as Director of LSE, which she took up in September this year. We are unbelievably pleased to welcome you, Minouche. You are already embedded in the institution, and uh, we, we are really pleased to be uh, supporting this evening's event, which is a launch of her initiative, one of her many initiatives, but the initiative of the annual academic theme for LSE. And her inaugural theme is timed to mark the 75th anniversary of the Beveridge Report, which really launched, as you'll all know very well indeed, the welfare state in the UK. And this theme now that Minouche is launching is called Beveridge 2.0, Rethinking the Welfare State for the 21st Century. So what we're going to do tonight is hear from Minouche some of her thoughts about this, and then we have a very distinguished panel that I will uh, introduce you to in, in a moment when we've heard from her. She will then pose some questions to the panel, and then we'll have some time for the audience to ask questions of her and of the panel. So before I formally introduce her, I would like to just make one or two points of housekeeping, which one always has to do at these sort of Sort of events. We're not expecting any kind of um, alarm, so if any alarm goes off, it's really real, and please um, be escorted out. Tonight will be recorded, and we will have a podcast so that others who are not either able to be here or online can be part of it. Um, please, could you put your phones to silent? Um, and if you want to be part of the Twitter, then we have the hashtag LSE Beverage uh, Twitter. Uh, handle for those of you that want to relay thoughts. So, Minouche, um, you are not, as you will, and many of you will know, Minouche is not a newcomer to LSE. She graduated with an MSc in economics in 1986. Um, and before she joined us here, as you will all, I'm sure, know, she was Deputy Director at the, the Bank of England and a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, MPC. She started her career at the World Bank and became the youngest ever Vice President of the World Bank. She then moved to the Department for International Development, DIVID, and became Permanent Secretary there in 2008. But throughout all this public service uh, role, she has kept a real foothold in academia, holding academic point appointments at the Wharton Business School in Pennsylvania and Georgetown. And uh, many of you will know she's written many papers and books on economics and applications. So we are really interested, Minouche, to hear your thoughts about Beverage 2.0, and it's great to welcome you here to LSE. Thank you. Thank you so much. So. Whoops. So good evening, everyone. Thank you, Shirley, for that uh, very warm, uh, warm introduction. Um, I thought I should start by explaining a little bit about the genesis of this talk uh, and how it came about. So 2016 was a very, a very tumultuous year, uh, I think, for, for many of us. Uh, 2016, we had the Brexit referendum. We had the election of Donald Trump. We had words like alternative facts and post-truth and enter, enter the public discourse. And the level of public debate became incredibly shrill and divided. And I found myself uh, quite upset in 2016 and really puzzled. And wanting to understand what had happened. So I had a bit, of, a bit of gardening leave when I left the Bank of England and before I started at the LSE. And I thought I really must spend time understanding why society is so divided and why public discourse is so shrill. I started by baking lots of bread. I found a bit of solace in the sourdough. Um, my family ate a lot of bread. <laughs> It did not have major global consequences. <laughs> I thought, this can't be the way. I must do the LSE thing, which is to understand the causes of things. What is behind this? What are the causes? 
And so I spent a lot of time reading. I spent a lot of time visiting some charities around the country, traveled to Birmingham, Nottingham, Leeds, uh, and used that time to kind of prepare and think about what role the LSE could play in dealing with these huge divisions that had grown in our societies. And I kept asking myself, what is it that holds our societies together? And what has caused uh, it to feel so divided? And how can we get to a better place? So that was the genesis. And over those months, I sort of formed a hypothesis, which was that the reason for these divisions and the anger was that the systems that we have for looking after people who had fallen behind and who fell on hard times were fraying. And that that failure of those systems, which I'm going to broadly call the welfare state, was only going to get worse because there are very powerful forces at play which are things like aging and globalization and technological change and inequality and automation, which will put ever more pressure on, on, on those systems. Having said that, I also think there are things we can do now to address those divisions and get our societies on a more socially sustainable path. And so, and, and, and I, I increasingly thought that the LSE was uniquely placed to address those issues. Uniquely placed because it is our job to understand the causes of things for the betterment of society. And that we had done it before, we had done it in our own history. And hence the idea of launching a research agenda, which we're calling Beverage 2.0, on the anniversary, on the 75th anniversary of the Beverage Report, to to ask these questions, because I think this is a moment when the LSE has a unique role in addressing uh, one of the biggest challenges of our time. So what I wanted to do this evening was first briefly outline a little bit of the history, but secondly, spend most of my time on looking at the causes of these divisions in our society and try and understand why the sustainability and social cohesion of our societies has, has deteriorated. And then thirdly, present a few ideas about how to better our societies and how to make them more socially sustainable. And then I will get much better ideas from the panelists who will join me thereafter. But let me start with a little bit of the history. Let me start with William Beveridge, who was one of my distinguished predecessors, and according to another one of my distinguished predecessors, Ralph Darendorf, arguably the greatest director of the London School of Economics. 75 years ago, there were queues forming around the corner in Kingsway, huge queues of people waiting to get copies of his report. Now, Beveridge was no obvious rock star, and his report had a rather unsexy title, social insurance and allied services. But his promise of a system which would support people from cradle to grave captured the public imagination. And his, his, his objective of vanquishing what he called the five giants of squalor, ignorance, want, idleness, and disease laid the foundations of what we call the modern welfare state. Now, that legacy evolved very differently in other parts of the world. The UK, in many ways, was a beacon for other countries. But the models evolved differently in the countries like the US and in Australia. You had welfare systems that evolved, which were much more based on individual responsibility, contributions-based uh, systems, and means testing of benefits. In continental Europe, systems were based on employers and employees sharing the risks to, to maintain income replacement and provide health insurance. In Nordic countries, you had a tradition of much more generous welfare payments and systems with universal benefits. And probably most recently where, you've seen, where we've seen the greatest evolution is in low and middle income countries, where in traditional societies, there was traditionally a much greater reliance on the family and the community to provide social safety nets. There has been a shift toward states and markets like in the advanced economies. And you can see that in most developing countries now, some form of cash transfer has become very prevalent. 
today we've gone from a system where only about 72 countries in the developing world had any form of social safety net to about double that, to about 149. And the levels of spending are still relatively modest, about 1.6% of GDP in low and middle income countries, but they're growing incredibly fast as both aging and the positive benefits in terms of school enrollment, household nutrition levels, and family incomes have been proven in the huge number of studies that have been done on the evolution of safety nets in poor countries. So huge changes around the world in thinking about the welfare state, many different models out there. Let me turn to my second theme about the causes of the pressures on social safety nets and welfare states today. Let me start with the most simple version of the social contract, which is that in a society, those who can work, do work, and those who can't, including the young and the very old and the dis disabled and the unemployed, get some support. Now, in most countries, this, this, the, piece, the pieces that support that social safety net are some combination of the family, the community, the state, and the market. And countries vary over, over what weight is given to each of those elements. The pressures that we feel today come from multiple sources. They come from increased demand for public services. They come from aging. They come from questions about the affordability of the current systems and people's willingness to pay for them. Let me say a little bit about what those pressures are uh, and what the consequences they have had for the welfare state. And I'll start with the most obvious, which is aging. This chart just shows very simply and dramatically the consequences of aging for for uh, the world between 2015 and 2050. Red is old. <laughs> and what you see is that by 2050, over the, the over 60s will double from about 12% of the world's population to almost 22%. And the geography of it is quite also very clear. You have a sort of old northern hemisphere where a significant portion of the population, almost a quarter, will be over 60. And really the only continent that's left, which is relatively youth, youthful by 2050, is Africa. The other element is, of course, what that does to the distribution. Now, as most of you know, I was born in Egypt, so I, I know my pyramids. And <laughs> we sort of have a pyramid in 2010. Uh, by 2050, that is at best a ziggurat. And by, 20, by 2100, it's almost a rectangle. That working age population will have to support a, both a young population, but, an, but also an incredibly large elderly population. And that has huge political consequences. If you look, for example, in the UK already, we spend much more on old people than young people, arguably because old people vote and children don't. So, Aging, huge issue, big changes. I should also mention that even though we tend to think of the advanced economies uh, as the ones where the aging is happening, the low and middle income countries will age about three times as fast and have to cope with a much more rapid pace of aging than the advanced economies ever had to. Uh, and 80% of the growth in old people in this period will happen in developing countries. So let's turn to globalization. Oops, that's too early for that. Let's turn to globalization. Uh, globalization is also another huge pressure on welfare states. It's often blamed for what's happened to wages at the low end of the spectrum, and it's often blamed for the pressures on social safety nets as countries have to compete with others who have weaker social, social systems, social benefit systems. I actually think the issue is less about workers in poor countries competing with workers in rich countries. And it's more an issue about the mobility of capital and the fact that capital can move very quickly elsewhere and labor mobility is very low. 
But as a consequence of the, the, the concerns about the social consequences of globalization, there is quite a lot of debate going on at the moment about the need to slow the pace of globalization, to allow societies to adjust, and especially when there are large regional effects. Let me say a couple of words about inequality, another huge pressure on the welfare state and social mobility. If you look at inequality in the world today, we've actually had an incredible convergence uh, of incomes between rich countries and poor countries, mainly because of the phenomenal growth that we've seen in China and India. But if you look at the advanced economies as a group, most of them have seen a sharp increase in inequality. And even worse, if you look at what's happened to wealth inequality as well as income inequality. It's been exacerbated uh, this trend in inequality by what's happened to tax policy in most countries. Fiscal policies in most countries have actually become more regressive over time. If you look at tax reforms that happened throughout the 80s and the 90s, they've tended to lower top tax rates, and corporate tax rates have also fallen sharply from about 32% on average in the OECD to about 25% today. And meanwhile, taxes on consumption, like VAT, have tended to go up. And of course, VAT is not a very progressive tax. We've also seen a sharp fall in social mobility. So if you look, for example, uh, at what's sometimes called the Great Gatsby curve, uh, the Gini coefficient on the bottom axis, which reflects income inequality, and then intergenerational income elasticity, which is basically the percent change in a child's income versus their parents' income and is an indicator of social mobility, you see that there's a very clear positive correlation. More unequal societies mean that the likelihood that children will do better than their parents is much reduced. And you see many countries in Latin America which are highly unequal and have very low levels of social mobility at the top. Countries like the UK, the US, somewhere here in the middle, and the Nordics inevitably in, uh, in the space of having high levels of equality and high levels of social mobility. You see the same thing when you look at what's happened to wealth in, in, in many countries. In Europe, for example, uh, in 1980, about 38% of private wealth was inherited. Today, that's closer to 54%. Let me say a couple of words about technology and automation, which is another source of pressure on the welfare state. Now, the fact that wages for unskilled workers have stagnated in many countries around the world is often blamed on globalization. I actually think technology is more of the culprit. Technology is, has clearly pressed down on wages of low-skilled workers, and that trend is likely to increase with a rise in automation. We all know the, the robots are coming. Um, <laughs> if you look at the potential for automation, most there are many, many estimates out there. Most people think at least about 50% of jobs will be affected by automation in the next 20 years. It varies enormously depending on what sector is, uh, is, is, is involved. But what's interesting, I think, about this wave of technological change is that, unlike the last one, which very much hit low-skilled workers in areas like manufacturing, this one will affect many of the professions. Uh, because many aspects of the professions lend themselves to automation. Things like accountancy, being a lawyer, being a teacher, being a doctor. Those professions too will see themselves, will see themselves change dramatically as a result of automation. Now what does this mean for jobs? The neo-Luddites say there'll be fewer jobs and we will increasingly be replaced by machine learning and, uh, and automation. Others are less fearful and argue that there will be some aspects of jobs which uh, are less repetitive and, uh, and, and mechanical, and there will be areas where humans still have comparative advantage, and we just need to figure out what those are. Either way, there will be renewed pressures on the welfare state as the nature of work changes and who contributes to it will evolve. Let me say something about uh, the fiscal pressures that the welfare state is under. There has been a huge increase in welfare spending around the world. This chart, if you, the lines show you how much 
as a share of GDP there was of social spending in 1960, the diamond is 1990, and the bar is 2018. And you have the usual array of countries, not surprising in terms of the pattern. But the very clear global pattern is that everyone is spending dramatically more. On average, countries went from spending about 10 to 15 percent of GDP in the 1960s to about 21 percent of GDP in 2016. And those pressures will only grow, and in particular driven by health costs. The IMF recently estimated that health spending will grow by about 3% of GDP for most advanced economies and by about 1% for most emerging markets. If you look at the UK, for example, as, an, as, a, as a good example, the welfare state, as Beveridge would have defined it, go, includes welfare, health, education, and state pensions, which amounts to about 70% of public spending. It is not an exaggeration to say the welfare state is increasingly becoming the state. Um, and the pressures for greater spending are obviously huge. You read it in the newspaper every day, be it the debates about NHS funding or social care funding. And yet the UK is in a situation like many countries after the financial crisis where debt levels are very high, where debt as a share of GDP has gone from 40% before the financial crisis to double that at 80%. And so how do you find room for additional spending when, uh, when, when debt levels have, have gone up to levels that we haven't seen since World War II. So, have I depressed you? Um, <laughs> let me turn uh, to, from the causes of the problem to some of the potential solutions for the betterment of society. I'll start by just saying, I think we're at a bit of an inflection point. We know these big tectonic shifts are happening and we know they're coming. They haven't arrived yet, but we can see the pressures that they're putting on our systems of social security. And the question is, what can we do to preempt them? There are a lot of parallels here with climate change, where you know you're on an unsustainable path, but you can act now to get yourselves onto a more sustainable one. So let me put out a few ideas about what we could do now, uh, and I'm sure there will be many others. Let me start with retirement ages. We all know we're going to have to work much longer than before, and especially oh, the young people in this room, especially you guys. <laughs> but we need to set expectations now about that. And for example, linking retirement age mechanically to life expectancy would be one way of doing that. We could say that from now on, the retirement age will move automatically to be always, I'm going to make up a number, roughly 10 years less than life expectancy. And so that people know uh, that that is what lies ahead. The Netherlands is a good example. The Netherlands raised the retirement age to 67 as of 2023, but as of 2024, it will just go up automatically with, the li with life expectancy in the Netherlands. If I was the finance minister of a developing country, I would do it today because my demographics are favorable and there will be very little political fuss today uh, and I will get ahead of a problem that will cause me much grief uh, if I wait 20 years. So linking retirement ages to life expectancy I think is a way to expand that group of people in the working age population who can then help pay for the welfare state going forward. Second, lifelong learning. You know, it's become a bit of a platitude. Everybody talks about lifelong learning and having to reskill for multiple careers in life. Um, but it clearly has to be a much bigger part of the future. One of the nicest things that happened to me today was I got a letter from a 73-year-old woman whose mother had just died and who, when clearing up her mother's things, had discovered that she had been admitted to the LSE in 1962 and her mother had never told her and she wanted to take up the offer. <laughs> and I thought, good for her. That's a great example of lifelong learning and making it real. But I, sh I think we also have to kind of make it practical. There's some good examples. Countries like the UK, little known fact, and the US have now abolished age limits for getting student loans. So you can get a student loan in your 60s if you would like. 
uh, and that needs to be a much more common thing, that people retool and reskill uh, for careers that are going to be much longer. Countries like Singapore have, are now giving every citizen over the age of 25 a 500 Singaporean dollar voucher for training that they can use at any point in their life and accumulate each year to decide what skills they might need in order to be more effective in the labor market. We also need to rethink our labor market institutions. I think one of the most interesting models out there is the model of what's called flex security, which is associated particularly with Denmark and the Netherlands. Uh, flex security is a, is a model which is based on three principles. That it's pretty easy for firms to hire and fire workers, but if workers lose their jobs, they get quite generous unemployment insurance to protect them in that period. And thirdly, there is incredibly generous and well-funded active labor market policies to help workers hit by economic shocks find new jobs. And if we know that the nature of work is about to change dramatically, maybe we should prepare ourselves by having systems which are much more based on a flex security model, which helps workers adjust to economic changes quite quickly. But you have to put real money behind it. The Danes spent 1.7% of GDP on active labor market policies. That's roughly equivalent to how much the UK spends on defense, just to give you a sort of ballpark estimate of the kind of resources that you need in order to enable your workers to adjust to big economic changes. Now, let me say something about universal basic income, which is often held up as a potential solution to a world where the robots are doing all the work, the people who own the robots earn all the money, uh, and the rest of us get a check from the government every month. Um, I guess my view on universal basic income, and we'll discuss it a bit more, uh, I think, in the panel, is uh, it could be part of the solution, but it's definitely not a panacea. Um, I think, uh, let me just put up an example here. I think the problem with universal basic income is that it's expensive because it goes, it transfers money to people who are not poor and it, uh, it uh, underplays the value of work in well-being. If you think of a scenario where everyone got a universal basic income which was 25% of the median income and that's this scenario here. And it's for a number of countries, ranging from sort of France, Poland, the UK, the US, Brazil, Mexico, Egypt, and South Africa, just as an illustrative spread. The fiscal cost of providing a universal basic income, which is 25% of median incomes in these countries, is roughly 6% of GDP. On average, it's about 6.5% of GDP in an advanced economy and about 3.75% of GDP for a developing country. Now, most countries couldn't, absorb, couldn't spend that much money without substituting this for existing welfare systems. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, relative to what you're spending on social welfare already, is this the best use of the income? If you did it, for example, for the UK, Imagine a UK universal basic income, uh, which would be about £1,839 per person per year. Uh, and that would go to every adult person. Again, the cost is around 6.7% of GDP. You would achieve a reduction in inequality and a reduction of poverty from about 9% to about 6%. But if you put that same money through the existing welfare state in the UK, you could achieve a much larger reduction in poverty. So I guess what I'd say about universal basic incomes is uh, I think most advanced economies have welfare states that are more efficient than that the universal basic income would provide. Many developing countries don't, and I think it could potentially have quite an important role to play there, especially in developing countries that finance a universal basic income with very progressive taxation and in countries where coverage of the safety net is very poor and where administrative capacity is limited. And especially if you use a universal basic income to substitute for really inefficient subsidies like energy subsidies or food subsidies. Now let me say something else about another possible solution which is part-time work. Part-time work is actually an, an incredible, a potentially very interesting response to the consequences of automation. 
if in fact the repetitive and routine bits of jobs are going to be automated with machine learning and robots, there will be a remaining bit. And just think, I mean, all of our jobs, all of us have bits of our jobs which are repetitive and routine and rather boring. Wouldn't it be nice if a machine did those bits and we could just do the fun and interesting bits? And I think increasing part-time work is a potential model which, which could emerge. But policy needs to facilitate that, and that is conceivable. In the Netherlands, for example, social security and entitlements are just adjusted pro rata to the number of hours that you work, and it is illegal to discriminate against part-time workers. And as a result, about half the population of the Netherlands works part-time, in contrast to the European average, which is about 20%. And of course, portability of benefits is key because if workers are gonna to have to be changing jobs more often and parts of those jobs will be automated, we need to facilitate not just part-time work but portability of benefits. And then of course, there are all the things we can do before the welfare state has to kick in. And those are what are sometimes called pre-distribution pre interventions. Now, politicians always like to say, you know, the welfare state should give people a hand up, not a hand out, right? Uh, and, and there is quite a lot of evidence that preventative and proactive policies, particularly in areas like health and education, end up saving huge amounts of money in the long term. I saw a recent study on the UK which looked at the cohort of children who benefited from policies introduced in the 1990s uh, around adolescent uh, deprivation. At that time, 27% of children in the UK were born in poverty, 8% uh, left school with no qualifications, uh, teenage birth rates in the UK were two times those of Germany and three times those of France, and you had huge evidence of adolescent deprivation. The government put in a huge number of programs, including income support, additional places in schools, preventative programs around, uh, around alcohol abuse and teenage pregnancies. And they worked. 20 years later, you look at that cohort of children and they had, grew up with much less child poverty, they stayed in school, and levels of teenage pregnancy and underage drinking had fallen by half. And those kind of programs, and we can have a debate about how cost-effective those interventions were, but what's clear is those interventions reduced pressures on the welfare state 20 years later. Finally, let me just say a few words about intergenerational equity and fairness. One of my colleagues here at the LSE, Nick Barr, uh, has said that the welfare state is three quarters piggy bank, piggy bank meaning it provides mutual insurance over the course of our lives, and only one quarter Robin Hood, Robin Hood transferring income from rich people to poor people. And John Hills, who's, who's here, has also made this point, that for the vast majority of people, we put into the welfare state as much as we get out. For most people, we consume services, we benefit from the welfare state when we're young, and then when we start to work, we start to put more money in, and then uh, when we get older, we benefit again in terms of health care and pensions. And over the course of a lifetime, that sort of balances out. Now that intergenerational deal is under pressure when you have rapid aging and when the economic circumstances of different generations is different. And so that, that social contract begins to break down. And so I think we need a bit of a discussion particularly, again, all those young people in this room, about this intergenerational contract. Because the risk, of course, is that the current younger generation will have to be paying a lot more into the welfare state to pay for the oldies uh, than, than they will get out. And Beverage 2.0 is exactly an attempt to foster that debate about intergenerational equity. So let me try and wrap up. Uh, I hope I've given you at least some hope and some ideas about what are the kinds of things we could do today to get our social system into a more sustainable place. But of course, my, my, uh, my perspectives come very much from that of an economist. Uh, so I'm very keen to hear from, 
those looking at this issue from other disciplines. And in that, in many ways, is the strength of the LSE to be able to bring multiple disciplines to answer these questions. I think the other key thing is that the answers to these questions are incredibly interconnected. Investing more in early education and health will reduce pressures on and reduce the need for redistribution later in life. Increasing part-time work and taxing it sensibly will mean uh, that there'll be less pressure on budgets and that, uh, that we'll be able to find solutions to things like well-being associated with work uh, as well. Sometimes, sometimes in life, making a problem bigger makes it easier to solve. And by looking at these things in a holistic way, we can find solutions we wouldn't find and think of otherwise. But the main purpose of today is to really start a conversation, to start a conversation about this issue of social cohesion and social sustainability, uh, which I think will be, will be one of the most important issues of our time. The LSE is holding a festival uh, from the 19th to the 23rd of February, where many of our faculty, our students, and members of the public will be debating these issues and asking questions about what should a welfare state look like for the 21st century, and how would we design it, and what can we do now to make it sustainable and to bring our societies together again. So I very much hope that you will all engage with that festival, uh, and we're gonna start the conversation right now uh, with my fellow panelists who, uh, who will bring a different set of perspectives to these very important issues. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for um, giving us a very broad-based um, uh, analysis of the causes, um, which I think was sobering, perhaps not really depressing, but certainly sobering, um, but also a, a set of very stimulating um, strategies for uh, approaching uh, solutions to, to, to where we are. As you say, we're now going to move into a, a, a more discursive uh, uh, panel discussion, um, and I'm really pleased to uh, welcome and to introduce four very distinguished contributors to the, this issue. If I start at the far end of the, the, the panel, Alex Verhoeve is Professor of Philosophy in the Department of Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Method here at LSE. Um, he works on the theory and practice of distributive justice, especially in health, and he's uh, served on the WHO's uh, Committee uh, on, on Equity. Consultative Committee on Equity. He's also visiting Professor of Ethics and Economic at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and we're really pleased that you're able to be part of the panel tonight. We then move to Richard Sennett, who I'm sure is well known to all of you as Centennial Professor of Sociology here at LSE and Professor of Humanities at the New York University. He's done a lot of work, as you'll probably know, exploring how individuals and groups make social and cultural sense of facts about the cities in which they live. And he's had an enormous number of externally validated successes and prizes, the Hegel and the Spinoza prizes. And uh, we are really very grateful to have a sociological perspective on the issues here today. We then have uh, Voltraud Schelkel, uh, who is Associate Professor of Political Economy at the European Institute here at LSE. Um, and adjunct professor of economics in the economics department at the Free University in, in Berlin. She's chair of the advisory board of the Center for Social Policy Research in Bremen, and we're really very pleased that you're here too. And then John Hills, who's Richard, Richard Titmus Professor of Social Policy here at LSE, and he's co-director of LSE's Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary International Inequalities Institute. Lots of ins there. Um, until 2016, he was director of the Center for Analysis of Social Exclusion, and he's currently chair of that organization known as CASE. He's done an enormous amount of work focusing on inequality and the role of social policy over the lifespan. So it's an enormously distinguished and illustrious panel, and I know Minouche is going to get the uh, discussion going by asking each of them a few questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Shirley. So I'm going to start with John. 
John, in your book, Good Times and Bad Times, you wrote about the myth of us and them uh, and how such myths color our discussion of the welfare state. So this issue has become even more acute given the fiscal pressures on the welfare state and given the lack of willingness to pay for it that has emerged in modern times. How do we address that? And how do we have a public debate about the social contribution and, the, and recreate a sense of social consensus about the welfare state? Well, <clears throat> I think it's worth looking back to what Beveridge achieved and the environment within which he did that. Uh, what he and the, the wider political movements that established the post-war welfare state in the UK succeeded in doing was exactly what you ended your, your talk with, which it, they succeeded in binding together different risks that people faced of different kinds. Um, this, when we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Beveridge Report, um, I remember the historian Peter Baldwin um, talking about Beveridge's vision of one for all and all for one. The government actually meets the three musketeers, <laughs> was, was the way he put it. And it's what I think is so, I think the real glory of his report is hidden away, except it became politically the most important part, are the assumptions that he has on page 120, <laughs> um, which take the art of straying beyond your remit to a whole new <laughs> level. I mean, here we are. This is you know, social insurance and allied services uh, designed to keep Beveridge out of trouble and out of the way of, out of, the, way of the Ministry of Labour at the time. And there he is saying, we will assume, he sounds like an economist here actually, we will assume <laughs> universal health care. We will assume universal child allowances. We will assume policies that create full employment. And then we shall proceed to establish a social insurance um, order. Um, you know, the social insurance was a tag on after that. And within that, benefits for people who were out of work, the, the working age population who were poor, was part of that much wider whole. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't just about want. He was about want and squalor and disease and ignorance and idleness. And they were bound up together. Um, today, the picture we have is very different. Welfare is not this all-encompassing welfare state. Welfare is used as the pejorative word to mean handouts to scroungers, demonized, stigmatized. And first of all, that side of it, and then the second side of it, vastly exaggerated in its cost. I mean, I am still shocked by the diagram you put up from the Treasury, which is the diagram I get when I get my annual taxpayer statement, which rather reassuringly shows how rather small the cost of overseas aid and the cost of <laughs> our, contribution, our net cost contribution to the European Union are at the moment. <laughs> but it has this enormous slab of welfare which sounds like these handouts to the unemployed. Not a bit of it. Those are a lot, most of those are benefits going to pensioners, they're the whole social care system, they're judges' pensions. There are a whole load of things under this pejorative title designed to create the idea that working age social security is incredibly expensive um, when, it's, when it's not. Um, and that's the exact reverse of what Beveridge and co. achieved. Now, you know, the, your question is how can we re recreate that? Now, I think I rather hope that we don't recreate that by what was seen as bringing Britain together in 1942 when the bombs were falling on all of us. Right. Unless you were in here as a member of ENSA um, re rehearsing how to, how to entertain the, the forces in this, in this, on this very stage. Um, so I hope that's not how we, we do it. Um, but somehow, to recreate this vision, we do have to create this sense that we are all in it together. Now, I think it was very interesting that the crisis did not recreate that sense. It might have done, mm. but it didn't. So what might? Um, I think some of it is in how we talk about the risks that we all face um, and how we, how we share them. Now, why should the potentially extremely high costs of coping with dementia be seen as something that is individually born, as opposed to the risks of contracting cancer, which are seen as something that's collectively born. 
Um, and I think one can widen that kind of, of, of identification of risks that we cover and risks that we don't, but we all face different kinds of risks, and, and there are swings and roundabouts in this, and that's, that's what we had 75 years ago as, as terms of a vision. I think ultimately maybe the answer to the question is what may bind us together are our, our feelings for our children and our grandchildren and, and those of others. Um, we may having survived the crisis, be in a position where we feel, I'm all right, Jack, and actually as educators, immensely reassured by the McKinsey diagram, which showed that <laughs> educators were at the bottom in the potential for robotization, which I, I have to say is a bit over-optimistic. Um, so we may think that we're all right, Jack, but I don't think we can be confident of that for our children. It is true that there are an increasing number of people who will inherit in Britain and France a lifetime's income of an ordinary earner. But they are the rather small majority. Most of us know that our children face enormous risks and enormous uncertainty. And I think that may be our way in to recreating um, that kind of solidarity which was maybe more personally born 75 years ago. Hmm. OK, let's come back to that. Valtra, uh, let me turn to you. Social policy reforms in European welfare states have, uh, have responded to some of the challenges that I've described, particularly deep divisions and support for the vulnerable. But do you think that the EU's policies, particularly on the importance of international mobility, the importance of portability of entitlements across Europe. Have they helped or hindered European, government, European countries to cope with these pressures? Yes, thank you, Minus. Um, I mean, the first thing to note is, um, as always, the European Union is, and the European welfare state is a mixed bag. Uh, that's always first to note there is not one European welfare state. Uh, the EU has very different influences. But, um, the European welfare state is under a permanent process of, of reform, in a permanent state of reform, and some of it will come hopefully out in a, in, a, in a contribution that our students from the European Institute will make to the LSE Festival. There are a few noticeable tendencies in how a very important division uh, has been addressed, and that's gender inequality. Remember that minority of women, uh, that's a bit suppressed. So. <laughs> The, uh, in pay or in public and private pensions, the, the, the European welfare state has really made advances with the help of the uh, European Union that has gone against gender discrimination, for example, in insurance, and it has been outlawed now. Um, pension entitlements have been put in, so notional pension entitlements, uh, Pension entitlements for notional work, uh, so contributions that have not been made because Typically, the female carer was off work, but they get now entitlements, which is one of the reasons why, for example, our pension uh, uh, spending doesn't go down, even though there were cuts, especially for the male mainstream worker. There's a noticeable shift to family policy. So while w uh, non-employment benefits have been cut, reduced, um, one can see that practically every country has introduced universal child benefits, better child care facilities, um, in order to make it possible for women also to enter the workforce and, and hold on to a job. Another trend is activation, so tying benefits to work or at least to training. Um, in order to overcome this division about which John has just talked, you know, between the strivers and the shirkers, the, the employed and the non-employed. Now, activation itself shows the ambiguous role that the welfare state has in overcoming divisions. Um, it's not only overcoming divisions, it also creates, so like discrimination or, or, or stigma, it also creates divisions. Mm. If you think about it, activation, while it, it it sounds like a terribly sensible policy to tie benefits to the ability, the, the, the activity of work or at least getting yourself job ready. It locates the problem on the side of the worker. They have not the right skills. They need some additional measures to get a job. Uh, and I'm afraid sometimes we in higher education or 
we academics as policy advisors even contribute to that impression that the problem always lies on the supply side of the labor market and not, for example, in the selectivity or discrimination of employers uh, in a slack labor market. So we are a bit colluding in this. Now, while I regard this kind of divisive impression uh, as, as largely unintended consequences of sensible policies, education and activation are sensible policies, one cannot but help sometimes to see also very intended division in some welfare state reforms. If you think about that recent reform of the UK uh, means test, the child credit, which is now the child element in the, in universal, uh, uh, in the universal credit, um, the benefit for the third child can only be claimed if it has been conceived under coercion. There is no such limitation in the universal uh, child or the ordinary child benefit. This rape clause, as um, critics have called it, gives them low-income mothers um, the enviable choice of either foregoing a very, you know, a significant allowance for their th third child or accusing the father of that third child of rape. And this has been put in law in this country um, in, in April this year. The general point I want to make with that is that the welfare state itself is a system of stratification as the godfather of comparative welfare state research, uh, Jester Esping Anderson has called it. He said the welfare state is uh, not just a, me a mechanism that intervenes in, um, in the structure of inequality, it is itself a system of stratification, meaning um, it, it is an active force in the ordering of social relations. Ascent them the deserving and the undeserving. That's almost inevitable. And that brings me to the final question that you had. What about um, you know, mobility and portability in, in the EU? The first thing I would therefore note here is that the EU has, gone, has pushed very hard against this distinction of only economic citizens, the mobile worker, and the full economic and political and social citizen that is to typically the resident native uh, per, uh, person. What was a right to move for workers only has become a right to move for workers and their families, even job seekers, and a bit more conditional for economically non-active uh, citizens, typically pensioners or students. Um, and the social entitlements, in particular public pensions, have become fully portable. You could argue that the rules are such uh, that the mobile uh, EU citizen is actually privileged by them. And this puts high demand politically on the destination countries who have to give all these benefits to uh, non-nationals, um, but it also puts high demands on, economically on the migrant, and that's quite right too, because that prevents that you have to justify with your productivity and with your you know, effort that you put into your work that you cannot be, that you justify a high wage and security level and that you are not pitched against the resident workers. And second, I don't think there is any evidence, I mean you had, I think you had here the slides where you can see how taxes, for example corporate taxes has gone down, but overall you cannot say when you look at spending levels that there was a race to the bottom, there is a leveling off basically. Um, Welfare provisions have been reformed with a host of concerns in mind, as I said, reconciling care and career for, for women, a sustainable pension finance, tackling long-term unemployment. Um, that tends to disfavor the male mainstream worker, and that's almost inevitable so, because the male breadwinner was privileged under the old golden age welfare state, and those privileges do now go. To, to, to summarize what I, what I wanted to say is the European welfare state, welfare states generally, and one of the most interesting aspects of your talk, I think, was that you show this is a worldwide phenomenon building up social security systems. They can uh, overcome some uh, divisions, but in doing so, inevitably create new ones. And the same holds for the EU social agenda. Um, it takes the view of the outside of national democratic processes, female voters, the young, non-nationals, and therefore has pushed uh, the, the, the member states to overcome old divisions, but is 
itself also responsible for some new ones. Okay, thank you, Valtrad. Let me turn to Richard. Um, you've thought a lot about universal basic income. Uh, what do you think of it relative to some of the alternatives like raising minimum wages, wage subsidies, other ways that we can help workers uh, at the lower end of the spectrum? And should we look at paying people for things that we haven't traditionally paid them for, but that are socially valuable? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> well, um, what I would say first about this is that beverage would not like basic income. Yes. Uh, because beverage uh, had a concept of the welfare state as the state actually targeting specific needs that people had and the state providing for them. Um, I think the person who would have liked it more is Ernest Bevan, who was uh, not the friend of beverage at all. He was a labor organizer who then became foreign minister uh, after the war. And he had a much more um, uh, doubtful view of the state's ability to target what people want, what they need, and much more, I think, in a way, uh, uh, more faith that people themselves would act rationally to take care of their own needs. Mm. So uh, there's a wonderful book by the way, on beverage by Josie Harris, if any of you want to read about this, in which this duel between these two, between the accountant and the, and the labor organizer is laid out in, in, in full. I would say that the problem, Manoush, is that the word universal, when we talk about basic income, which is in a way misleading about it, there are some forms of basic, basic income covers many, many different kinds mm. of, uh, acti uh, of strategies. One form of truly universal income was that uh, thought of by Thomas Paine in the 1770s. And it was a one-time payment for everybody who, when they reached the age of 21, of in today's pounds, 30,000 pounds, to do with uh, as they would. And the state, in other words, would give them the means to set up their own life without controlling the way they would do it. If they, if they gambled it or drank it all away, too bad. Nobody was then going to come to their aid. Uh, today, uh, uh, um, and by the way, my, uh, this is a very popular uh, notion among American uh, basic incomers that rather than a year by year, we should give people at the beginnings of their life enough money. In your case, it would be to pay off your debts to the <laughs> LSC, but that they have enough money to launch themselves in the world. Today, um, once you take out the universal out of basic income, the idea in many attempts at, at, uh, at providing birth, uh, basic income is to give it to only to people who are likely ne to need it. Nobody wants to write a check to Donald Trump. Uh, in Brazil, for instance, a Bolsa Familial is a form of basic income given, but it's means tested mm -hmm. to people who fall be be behind, below a certain level. Uh, a, a great graduate of the LSE, Orlando Patterson, who's now a professor at, uh, at Harvard, when he was uh, 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 welfare minister of Jamaica, uh, translated this into, if you're below a certain income, you always have access to a minimum uh, of 10 basic household uh, goods that you needed, you know, uh, food, uh, toilet paper, things like that, to, to, lead, to lead a decent life. But again, it was means tested. I think the trouble with basic income comes because, and this is what I really want to say to you about this, because in its 
forms, the liberty given to people, assumes that they do not have to, uh, it's not correlated to the obligation to work. That you can get support is in the Bolsa Familial, whether you're at work or not. Your, your children have a right to eat, you know, whether you've got, whether you're employed or not. I think the problem here is that there is an assumption of shirking, that if people uh, are given money to spend as they will, that they'll misspend it or they'll go to the pub. And um, that's what I want to really just focus on for a moment with you. There are many, many uh, experiments today in basic income. Some good like that at Utrecht, the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands, some a mess like the one that's going on in Finland at the moment. Uh, but what we know from a lot of these experiments, one thing stands out. People want to work. The only people who use basic income to work less are mothers with young children for the obvious reason. They want to use this in order to spend time with their children. Um, it's a kind of, I don't know whether it's class prejudice or what, but the notion that is if you give poor people money, they'll waste it, that they don't want to work, that they'd rather be spongers rather than people who can maintain their dignity by being productive, taking care of their families. This is a, a sociological nonsense. And uh, so the fear, this kind of right-wing fear that we're going to spoil or corrupt people by giving them the freedom to support themselves if they need to be supported I think is something we have to get out of our minds. And that brings me to the final thing I'd like to say about this. I have diverged from my friend Philippe van Parish, who will be speaking here in the spring. Mm, is that it's it? part of the festival. As a wonderful exponent of uh, basic income uh, policy. I've diverged from him in his notion that because he too reacts against this negative impulse of people who would be corrupted if they had freedom, that he has pushed the issue of work outside the domain of basic income. To me, the correlate of providing basic income to people who need it is a new way of of, of doing, finding ways for people to share scarce work. Because uh, the people for whom uh, automation, those other pressures that you talk about, are going to miss work from are people at the bottom. You know, they're, they're going to suffer, and we know they already have suffered, from some forms of automation mm -hmm. or work flight out of Europe to, to uh, cheaper economies. So in my view, the notion of sharing, finding ways to organize work so that, say, three people share one job and for the two-thirds they're not working, they get basic income, is uh, these two things go together which takes me, ironically, back to beverage, because that requires a state. It requires a state that has real, comprehensive control of, of work, of how work is organized. In the Netherlands, uh, it's been, this, what I'm talking about has been tried, and it's required the um, services of accountants of uh, uh, mathematicians, of all those people that Bevan uh, scorned, in order to provide people with uh, a combination of both labor and support. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Let me go, go to Alex. Alex, you've written a lot about there are many reasons to care about inequality and that we have to think about inequality in many dimensions. Um, how should the welfare state address inequality in those different dimensions? And how do you think about this question of 
how much piggy bank versus Robin Hood the, the welfare state should be. Good. Uh, well, thank you, Minush. Um, since I'm a philosopher, I thought I would shy away from particular policy proposals and think for a moment about what we would want to get out of the welfare state. What should its aims or underlying ideals be? And for that, I also went back to, to Beveridge, but to some other thinkers also in the LSE tradition. And one thinker in the LSE tradition is Nicholas Barr, who has this slogan um, it, that it's three quarters piggy bank and one quarter Robin Hood. And uh, philosophers pay tribute to important thinkers by criticizing them. So I want to start out by saying that this, uh, as a <coughs> slogan to encapsulate the ideals of the welfare state, is rubbish. <laughs> Why is that? Now I know, oh, of oh, course, that I know that I know that um, Nicholas Barr and also uh, Minouche, who used the slogan, actually, the slogan hid some other ideas which we all endorse. But let me put it provocatively: Look, a piggy bank suggests that you put money into it, and then at some later time you get money out of it. What this suggests is that elements of the welfare state that are like health savings accounts in the United States which is the government tells you you get to uh, have tax-deductible savings, which you can use if you are in need uh, of, uh, and you can use it tax-free if you need expensive health services, but you can also just extract it at some tax penalty and use it for yourself. Now, interestingly, Beveridge mentioned that there were private associations of this kind before he brought in mm. his proposal, and he said this is not what the welfare state is about. Because the welfare state is about something else. You, you mentioned Minush, and of course this is something that uh, Nicholas Barr knows well. One element of it is, so to speak, self-interested, or uh, to speak with John, maybe family-interested, which is insurance. I want insurance for myself and my family. That means that I put stuff in but I needn't necessarily take that out because if I'm fortunate, if my family is fortunate, we will not use, for example, the expensive health services. So it's different from a piggy bank. Insurance, a piggy bank and insurance are not the same thing. And uh, insofar as the welfare state is that, we do appeal to a notion of self-interest or family interest to motivate people to uh, sustain the institutions. Why would we need government institutions here? Well, Nicholas Barr expertly analyzes what many economists know, which is that there are so many market failures, especially in health insurance, where I work on, that it's often useful to have either uh, a system like the NHS with mandatory contributions and a single provider, or what countries like the Netherlands have and what Obamacare has attempted to be mandated, very heavily regulated with subsidies and stuff, private health insurance. Now, if that were the end of the welfare state, we would, we would stop and say with Brian Berry, uh, a famous LSE political philosopher, that the welfare state is an instrument for justice as mutual advantage. John and I both care about our own risks and about our kids' risks, our family's risks, and we pool our resources so that we can ensure them. But there's, of course, a second element, which is John and I might know that we're comparatively, compared to some other people in society, at relatively low risk. Mm. And our families might be at relatively low risk or high risk. So the ideal insurance package for each of us may differ. And uh, that's one, another element is that some of us have much more to spend, so to speak, much more ability to pay a premium for these insured services than others. Now, these differences in risks are law and differences in purchasing power are largely due to factors beyond people's control, not wholly, but largely. Uh, and in, in that extent, they're products of what many philosophers have called good and bad brute luck. And it's there where we force people who are at relatively low risk to purchase more comprehensive insurance than they would for themselves in order to help those who are at relatively high risk, and we force the rich to pay higher premiums than they would in the market to subsidize the poor so that we transfer from the uh, 
healthy and wealthy to the sick and the less well off. That's where the element of Robin Hood might come in. Right? But it's very interesting, and just to say, I should say before, so there is, a, there is an element of Robin Hood, I think, in the uh, welfare state, and we might better put it as this idea of sharing out the fruits of uh, unearned good fortune. Brian Barry called this justice as impartiality, our LSE thinker. But what's really interesting is that when you look at the beverage report, though this is an element, beverage appeals to those who are infirm, invalid, etc., and that we ought to help them, it's not the heart of his proposal. He appeals rather when he's considering, for example, uh, he asks why should minors who are at high risk, health risk, not pay higher premiums than accountants right, or professors. He says, look, the miners have rightly argued that their services are required for the accountants and the professors to do their work. We might now say those are constructing around us at LSE and are at higher risk than the professors who are inside, right? Uh, what we, we jointly produce, this, the institution, it's not that I do my thing and they do this other high-risk thing, but rather their risks are part of my production, so to speak. This is a notion of reciprocity, or some might say claims to the product of our joint labor. And our labor extends beyond, I think, our, our work to sustaining the social institutions that make possible these exchanges. So this is against the individualization, and it's against this idea that it's merely spreading out good and bad fortune. It's about fair claims to the product of our joint labor, or fair reciprocity, we might call it. Also an idea proposed by John Rawls. Now that will take me to my final point, which is an idea championed by Rawls, but also Richard Tawney, uh, another LSE thinker and economic historian, in his wonderful book, rewritten many times, Equality. And he says, look, what's wrong with very large inequalities, not just with any old inequality, material inequality, but very large ones, is that they make it impossible to have a society in which people meet each other as equals. And they make it impossible to have a society in which we can believe that we're jointly producing something good, producing and reproducing good social institutions and fairly distributed benefits and burdens of social cooperation. Rather, they pit us against one another. He says, he talks especially about the attitudes that very large inequalities uh, generate. He says, among arrogance uh, among the better off and servility among the less well off. Also, the idea of uh, kind of destructive envy and resentment among those who quite understandably feel themselves hard done by and downtrodden by the better off. And in response to this destructive envy, a jealous guarding of comparative advantage uh, by the better off. Now, all these attitudes are, of course, great vices. You would want them for your children, right? But they also destroy, they're not just personal vices, they destroy this idea of a social <coughs> contract Right, of cooperation among equals. And so Tawney emphasizes something, I think, which is another aim that we could ask of the welfare state, which is that it, it does its bit to allow us to create the society in which we can uh, meet each other in the social, social sphere as equals with a sense of dignity. Now, it's very interesting, Waltrud mentioned you know, we shouldn't idealize the welfare state. This, I'm talking about aims for the welfare state, not how it necessarily operates. The example that you gave, Waltrud, of uh, having to choose between supporting your third kid um, uh, and uh, then you, if, you, if you do that, then you have to do this, I would say, humiliating and awful uh, and also alienating claim that it was due to circumstances beyond your control or even rape or force that you became pregnant. Now that is a case in which the welfare state would 
do something precisely contrary to this fourth purpose, right? because it, it would be humiliating, robbing people of dignity, and making them powerless in the face of bureaucracy. Whereas ideally, it would guarantee people a sense of power vis-a-vis -vis their employers, because they keep essential social benefits. That's one thing, of course, that basic income gives people, right? That you can't make me depend on your whim as an employer because if you treat me badly or try to humiliate me, I'm out of here because I have my basic needs covered. <laughs> so one that guarantees, so to speak, dignity and that does not humiliate, that is a fourth rule. So let me sum up. I've tried to build on LSE thinkers to criticize another eminent LSE thinker, or at least the slogan, <laughs> Nicholas Barr, right? So the slogan was, piggy bank Robin Hood. I've said no piggy bank. In fact, and only a little smidgen of Robin Hood. In fact, if we say, what are the four aims of, that we should want our welfare state to look after, it would be mutually advantageous insurance, where the advantaged units are not just us individually, but as John Hill says, uh, our families. Redistribution of good fortune, fair reciprocity, and helping people participate in social life as equal cooperators with a sense of dignity and security. Why is this important? It's just, I, th I think it's important. I spent the last year actually in the States working for the National Institutes of Health. I was contracted <laughs> under the Obama administration to come in as a philosopher to work on uh, a new justification for mandatory health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I arrived and my services were no Great longer success. required. <laughs> <laughs> I quickly submitted the article by January. I'd never had such a hard <coughs> deadline before, you know, academics with deadlines. Anyway, um, but what struck me there, that, uh, so I was working on basically the justification of the Obamacare mandate. What struck me there was the predominance of this idea of purchasing insurance for you and your family. What type of deal are you getting out of this? Now that's not entirely wrong, but it's only, I've, I've tried to argue, only one small part of the whole picture. <clears throat> it's not just about you and your family and pooling risks in an advantageous manner, nor is it just about helping those with pre-existing conditions, which is what the Democrats kept harping on about. Right? It's broader than that. It's, I've tried to draw on our tradition at LSE to add two ideals to the mix. Fair reciprocity. We produce things in society together. It's not you produce your thing and I produce my thing and then you have more than I do, so let's Robin Hood some stuff away from you, <laughs> right? It's we've produced these things together so we both have a claim on this social surplus. And finally, the idea that together through mandatory uh, insurance, and institutions of the welfare state, we can try, though we may fail, as Walter indicated, to do things to create a society of equals in, which also help us become more civil, at least avoid these evils of incivility and, and uh, division. So I would hope that by pointing out, keeping these ideals firmly in view, we know what people, we can try to persuade people what they're paying for, not just for, I mean, I agree with John, it's for your family, but it's also for all these, these oh, other yeah. things. Okay, thank you, Alex. I think it's time for me to open it up for questions and discussion from the audience. Uh, I think there's some mics floating around. Uh, maybe the gentleman here, we'll start with you. Any, if we could have, I'm looking for a student. I'm looking for a, preferably a female student. <laughs> it's okay, I won't discriminate. We'll start with you and then maybe the one in the back. Please. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask about the, I think it's the second major book of, uh, of Beveridge, uh, which he wrote, I think, after the war, which was the book about voluntary associations, because that and yes. related to voluntary insurance as well, because Beveridge, as I understand it, was setting minimal terms the welfare state would provide for minimal needs, but 
Everything over and above that, that was up to the individual. And there has been nothing really talked about what is up to the individual over and above what the welfare state is producing. But for beverage, that was very important. And I think you might even relate this to things like um, attempts to merge people into additional pension uh, benefits, but I can think of this in a variety of other areas as well. So perhaps we could comment upon that second part of beverage too. Okay, maybe I'll collect a couple of questions and then bring it back to the panel. We had one here, yes. Uh, yes, hello. Um, it's a privilege to ask a question to such a distinguished panel. Um, but what I found uh, quite glaring, especially in uh, the introduction um, from our lovely director here at LSE, um, was although you mentioned inequality and um, increasingly regressive taxes, when you came on to possible solutions, you didn't mention at all raising taxes on the rich. You're absolutely right. And um, surely any discussion about the future of the welfare state has to, um, or cannot avoid this political question. Um, and it, surely it must confront... <laughs> Thank you. I'll come back to that, you're absolutely right. Surely it must confront um, kind of the timidity of states in the face of the super rich. And um, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's my question. question. Yeah, yeah. question. I think we should confront this. The question we'll is clear. There was one in the back, I think, yes. The, the lady in the middle in the back. Maybe can I give you the beverage? Is that an important question? Hi. Um, okay. I'm curious about the lack of discussion about climate change, uh, both as a source of additional strain on welfare states. I mean, we're talking about massive expenditures on managing the costs of climate change. Uh, as well as potential roles for the welfare state in leading or managing a energy transition, a decarbonization. Okay. Can I ask a quick related question as long sure, as I have the ahead, microphone? Thank we'll you. The um, I'm curious also relatedly um, if you're to respond to this question about risk and climate change and how we share risk, um, what you think the role of the 21st century welfare state in the global north is to um, the post-colonial states of the global south. No. That's mm. it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take the tax progress progressivity question and then I'm going to pass to, to my colleagues. Uh, you're absolutely right. I had scribbled on the top here, include progressive taxation in conclusions in the next revision. So yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think part of what we've seen in the last 20 years is Technology has exacerbated income inequality, but tax policy has made that worse, not better. Uh, and so if you look across the OECD countries, the progressivity of the tax system has gotten worse. Uh, so rather than do what it should do, which is counteract what's happening in the economy, it's done the opposite. Uh, and clearly there's a huge issue. Uh, you know, current proposals in the US for tax reform are going <coughs> in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, many recent reforms in other countries have done the same, so absolutely right. I mean, we even have the IMF calling for raising top tax rates uh, in the world, and that's completely appropriate. Did you want to...? Well, uh, can I start with that? Um, <clears throat> it seems to me there's an analogy here. Um, there are people who live on islands that are hit by hurricanes, and I think as an international community, it is our obligation to help them. I also think, and maybe I'm thinking here of the British Virgin Islands, that it is the obligation of the people who live on those islands who have great wealth to contribute to the system. So I think we shouldn't just be thinking about top tax rates, we should also be thinking about the very large network of tax havens which this country supports. And at a very minimum, we should be <laughs> insisting on tra tax transparency um, as part of that. So you're absolutely right, these obligations are both international and, and domestic. Um, in terms of the point about going beyond what the state provides, I and mean, Beveridge was very much about a flat rate minimum. What he did not put in place, though, were effective mechanisms to build on that. 
And it may be that the kind of model that we've now had running for a few years, which you referred to in terms of automatic enrollment of nudge, in terms of you have to opt out of an additional pension, which so far we've only taken baby steps in terms of the contribution rates people are putting in, is an example of creating a structure which allows something to happen that the market by itself, and which voluntary action by itself, does not actually create. The, the, the market by itself is not going to create, and has not created, effective insurance for long-term care. The, the structure of the problem is one that is not, the insurance problem is not one that is soluble by, uh, by private mechanisms. <coughs> Um, but there are ways, so the state, there are places where the state should intervene, but there are other places, I think you're right, where the state can provide a platform and then a structure which enables people to go beyond that for themselves. And I think mm. I, if I wanted to criticise the beverage settlement, it did not have that part in place. Mm. Others? Richard. Well, you, you raised something that is a great puzzle to me about beverage, which is um, that... Uh, that second book is a book in a way of, of um, let me put it this way, you in Britain have a long and glorious tradition of voluntary association among poor people who are being screwed by the system. <laughs> you have, you had burial societies in the 19th century. Um, you were a kind of model of Tocqueville's idea of people being able to collaborate with each other in associations to do the things that the state would either uh, not do for them or lie about its capacity to do. That's, that tradition comes out of a real skepticism about the relation of power to the people. Here is Beveridge, after the war, having created this system, which is a state, who's writing a book which invokes this long tradition that the people are against the, you know, the state is against the people. <laughs> and is written with, I don't know what page it is, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's written with the same dryness at, in which a passion appears at the end that people have to take care of themselves because the state is going to betray them. It's a great, great conundrum to me, you know, in the history of social thought, why, why, why this is. I have to say that I'm more convinced personally by the post-war beverage than by the welfare state beverage. I think power is likely to oppress people. And you've had, as I said, this glorious history of recognizing that fact and doing something about it. The one thing I would just like to correct in your statement about this, it isn't the individual and the state. Beverage is always thinking collectively. And this goes back to, to your point about this. Mm -hmm. He's not thinking about individuals. He, he's not um, in any way a kind of Ayn Rand kind of figure. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's thinking the alternative to the state is voluntary association. It's very puzzling. Interesting. Alex, you wanted to come in. So again, I quite agree with your point. And we should really think about it as a welfare system rather than the welfare state. And the state can do a lot of things uh, in conjunction with voluntary, private, charitable, etc. organizations. Coming from the Netherlands, I'm uh, a lot of our schools, hospitals, private insurance, etc., all with the hand of the state is run not by the state. It's facilitated by the state. The yeah. state mm -hmm. gets institutions in place that allow these things to happen. Now, what's really interesting is that at present, you would, ex you would expect a conservative government in Britain to... Uh, be on the side of this type of thing, but just because it touches us academics, but it's a nice case study and, and work by a, a colleague of mine, Michael Otsuka in the philosophy department on pensions, it's fantastic. He's showing how new regulations are systematically undermining the idea of joint, mutual, mutually advantageous insurance against, as he calls it, living too long, right? 
Um, and that a series of regulations, maybe or not intentionally, are undermining this idea of fair reciprocity and institutions that we are adding on to the minimum of the state. So that's a wonderful piece. In relation to uh, your point about, I just want to give one other LSE philosopher their, their, their due, Peter Deitch about tax rates. <coughs> one of the main challenges for taxing uh, wealth, which is, of course, capital and in income, highest incomes are, to a large extent, much disproportionately capital incomes, is tax avoidance and tax evasion, right? Mm. And a wonderful book by an LSE philosopher is um, Peter Dietz's Catching Capital, detailing various proposals, mm. and there's some follow-up work there. Uh, of course, also Gabriel Zuckman, who is here and also at, at Berkeley. So there's, I think that you, you're quite right. Um, there's a lot of work here mm. and elsewhere, of course, trying to tackle these, uh, these challenges. Okay, very good. I'm gonna have one here and one back there, and maybe one here, and then I'm afraid we're gonna to have to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a, a couple of observations and a question. Um, it seems to me that the advance of technology is construing against collective solutions, which of course insurance is one of them, because big data is enabling us to decide for ourselves increasingly whether we're at risk or not and whether we want to opt out of the risk pool and pay the insurance premium. Um, the second comment is something that relates very much to what Alex was just talking about. I'm afraid I'm to blame for part of that because I was perhaps the designer of pensions, freedoms and choice. Um, However, at the time that we put it together, which was in late 09, early 10, um, we did include in the documentation that both the individual and the state should be protected from downside risks. Um, that bit did not materialize when Freedom and Choice was launched in 15, and that is much to my regret. Um, so I think one of what, what, what bubbles to the surface here is Freedom and choice in the context of pensions is the genie's out of the bottle and we can't put it back because it happens to be very popular. And this has profound implications, particularly for those on the centre centre left who favour collectivisation of risks. There's a major debate raging, pensions have set it off. It's absolutely relevant to Beverage 2.0. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think there was one here. I wonder if you could address the uh, problem of complexity itself. Uh, in the era since uh, Beveridge wrote and now, uh, there are many drivers in uh, economic and social uh, uh, that are, are making life and more and more complicated. Uh, and, and I just wonder if this, uh, if you could address how this affects the ability to deal, for government to deal uh, with, the, with the problem of the welfare state. Okay, thank you. And there was one more. I believe. Oh, it's, it's me, I think. Sorry, I lost you. Yeah, oh. There we are. Thank you very it's, much. It's um, uh, John McDermott from The Economist. Um, I'm astonished at the end of this discussion, which began with, a to uh, with the premise of rising populism, that nobody, not in, on, really on the panel or in the audience, has talked about the relationship between migration and diversity mm. and the welfare state. Yeah. Because when I do my reporting, it's certainly something that comes up again and again and again. And I know that there's been a lot of academic work and there's a whole discussion about its role there. So I just wanted to ask, do you think there is a trade-off between levels of diversity and immigration and the generosity of a welfare state? Okay, good. I'm gonna start just by taking the climate change question which we didn't answer. Uh, and uh, I guess to be completely honest, I was worried that we were, we were setting out an agenda that was already too big and ambitious and that if we added climate change to it, it would be somewhat overwhelming. But clearly climate change, particularly over the long run in terms of what it will do to the economy, what it will do to the tax base and so on, will be yet an, ad an, ad an additional longer term pressure on, uh, on, uh, on the welfare state. So I wanted to just acknowledge that but apologize for not, not giving it full justice. Uh, let me turn to the panel and see which of those uh, issues they'd like to take up. I can actually say something <clears throat> on the migration question, but also I would like to briefly respond to the climate change as well. I mean, what it, it clearly is a, a challenge for the welfare state, because if you, for example, 
tax um, pollution and all these things higher, that tends to hit uh, poor people more. Uh, what it clearly will require is to, to move from the transfer-heavy welfare state to the service-heavy uh, welfare state. In other words, creating much more, for example, seeing public transport as part of the welfare state that we, that we devise uh, in a redistributive or in a sense that it helps particularly people who need to, to substitute for, for car, uh, uh, for private transport. Um, whether the global north will share with the south, I think not voluntarily. I'm pretty skeptic about that. But the good thing is, to some extent, that the global south now threatens the global north, namely with migration. And this is how it's going to happen. That then you see that you need to make life livable in the south, uh, and that perhaps changes something. And that brings me to this question. No, I don't think. If I look at Europe, I don't think there is a trade-off between diversity. If you think about insurance, risk sharing, and, and so on, it's actually a good thing to be diverse. Yes, there are always limits, and it requires adaptation. But um, there is research on this. Burgoon has, has done a wonderful large piece from, from the Netherlands. Whether it's cultural or whether it's, so to speak, the fiscal implications of high migration, and this a very clear evidence that people people resent to be uh, have to pay for migrants, but they don't necessarily resent them for their cultural traits, not generally. And I would hope that is exactly uh, how we are going to live together. The, the nation state itself was something that actually brought people together with very different beliefs and so on, the secular welfare, uh, nation state. And I think the welfare state makes this also uh, much more possible if you don't, uh, you know, kind of restrain the, the, the fiscal resources to deal with, with that. I mean, I think the migration thing is double-edged, though, because obviously immigration is a solution to the, to the age pyramid problem. You bring in young workers and you expand the, those contributing. On the other hand, there is an argument that you can politically and socially sustain welfare states more easily in societies that are homogeneous, and the more diverse they become, the harder that, the more the us and them thing becomes a bit of a problem. Uh, so, you know, it benefits the welfare state on the one side and creates new tensions, I think, on the other. Alex, you wanted to... Yes, so I'm, I'm a philosopher, not a social scientist on this, and this is precisely the question, how we find new forms of solidarity. Where solidarity is this, this interesting mix. There's, you recognize yourself and the other, which may mean that you and I together are doing something, right? and that makes us sympathize strongly with each other. And find some institutions for our mutual advantage. But it also means sometimes becoming, being willing to sacrifice something for your sake. Right? Now, the sci social science that I know suggests that when we conceive of ourselves as involved in a reciprocal relationship, and there are even some experiments of this kind, we're much more solidaristic, willing to cover each other's risks than not. And so, uh, I mean, we have someone here who knows a lot more about reciprocity and solidarity. So a real challenge, I would say, to the social scientists here is what mechanisms of generating this sense of we're producing something together can we put in place? Uh, and this needn't be the state, right? It can be the state facilitating us doing stuff uh, together. I'm just calling to mind a vignette from the Netherlands where Limburg, the south of the Netherlands, is very agricultural aging population. Also the place where Geert Wilders is from, the Dutch nationalist, right? Catholic as well. It's always felt different from other parts of the country. Now, initially, large influx of Polish workers who, were, who tilled the fields and, and got the vegetables, and especially asparagus, which is what they're famous for. And initially, I read a, a series of articles about this. People felt very distant from them. Who are these foreigners? I can't buy my products in the store anymore. So it really was cultural distance. Then the Catholic Church got creative and said, look, we used to have a harvest festival. We don't do it anymore because our boys and girls aren't working in the field. You are working in the field. You used to have a harvest festival in Poland. And we're all Catholics. Let's have a Dutch-Polish harvest festival. <laughs> because we produced something together, let's celebrate it together. And they had mass in Polish and in Dutch, etc. So there can be social innovation. Right? No, solidarity doesn't come from nowhere. It came 
You know, Beveridge keeps referring to the war yeah. in the report. That's right. Let's, uh, let's avoid that, right? Exactly. Let's. Exactly. I'm, I'm suspicious of the state trying to do it, but the state can indirectly, and politicians, thought leaders everywhere, can try, maybe, to facilitate the institutions that slowly build solidarity by, uh, in the mechanism identified. Mm, very good point. Anyone else, Richard, John, anything you want to add? I think that might be a very good point to end because I think that is in some ways the whole purpose of this initiative is getting all of us to think a little bit about how do we recreate that social solidarity and how do we rebuild uh, that cohesiveness that Beveridge envisioned without going to war. Uh, but uh, but through the through the through the weapon of social science research. Um, so uh, thank you all. Thank you to the panel for for being here.